and I had a nice list of things, you know, vote green so you can get a new pedestrian crossing on Brown Road, and, you know, worry about the dog shit in the park and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and this young man opened the door and said, oh, never vote. Why should I vote green? And I mentally ran down my list of pedestrian crossing dog shit and thought, this isn't going to happen. And so I told him about citizens' income. I told him about the Green Party policy of basic income. And this non-voter, this lucky man up in tax for politics, I went, oh. And he really got it there on the doorstep. I still can't guarantee he went and voted Green in the council election. <laughs> but he did get it. And I think we can actually really, we need to get out to the public. You know, we've got a lot of work to do in academic circles, work with mathematical calculations, but we need to get out to the public and explain it to the public. And we really can win because we are living in the politics of fear. Someone in the break was asking me what do I think about UKIP? And in short, the answer is that's the politics of fear. And what we have to do is vitally important for all of our futures that we have a democracy that offers people hope. And I think citizens' income can very much do that. You know, I think, however, we're going to be doing a lot of work sitting in a lot of rooms like this talking about citizens' income, talking about the economics of citizens' income. And one of the real challenges we have is one of the things that causes absolute, causes conventional economists to tear their hair out, is it's very hard to model how people behave when you introduce the citizens' income. It really does change everything, and how people will react is very hard to judge, particularly when you put it in mathematical terms. I mean, I uh, always think of one of the things that I'm quite confident will happen under citizens' income is we'll get a great deal more bad poetry written. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be lots more people who are really convinced this is their vocation and they're going to spend their life writing poetry. Which is where I get to the sort of topic of my uh, talk here because one of the things about bad poetry <coughs> is it has a very low carbon footprint. <laughs> You don't even have to print it, really, so yeah. very, very low carbon footprint. And you know, we actually are at a real crunch point. We've been talking a lot earlier about how our society is not delivering for the million people dependent on food banks, the 20% of workers on less than a living wage. But also, within that framework where so many people aren't getting enough resources, aren't getting the kind of justice that the guy was talking about out of our society, we also have a situation where collectively, all of us, no matter how you personally live, we're collectively in Britain each year using resources of three planets. But we've only got one planet. And so while we introduce that social justice, while we make sure that everybody has enough the access to the resources to a decent quality of life, which citizens' income can do, we're also going to have to ask quite a lot of people to actually take less resources out of our environment. And this is the trade-off we're offering, really, is you have the safety, you have the security, you have that net, that you have that cushion of citizens' income that's there to catch you. And you don't have to keep scrambling up the poles and keep buying the more expensive house and the more expensive car and the bigger this and the bigger that, because you don't have to worry about sliding down so far. And this, I think, is how sustainability and citizens' income fit together. You take away the feeling that you have to scramble, you have to go, go up the ladder, now, ultimately, what we want to do, of course, is make the ladder much less steep. But if you take away that fear, then you really, it's easy to ask people to give up the stuff that you've really got to do. Now, I think it's worth thinking about some of the potential other impacts, too. And I think one of the things that, again, the economists get really horrified by is the suggestion that you might have to really change wage differentials if you have a citizen. It might be that you have to pay the sewer cleaners quite a lot of money. <laughs> I got caught once in an audience when I said that, and someone said, my friend's a sewer cleaner and he loves his job. <laughs> but I think we all know what I mean by saying pay the sewer cleaners. We might pay the sewer cleaners more than the bankers. <laughs> which is an interesting thought. You need bankers. <laughs> exactly. The New Economics Foundation has a great stuff on that. But, you know, even more than that, if you start to think about how a citizen's income can change our society, what I always think of is those really horrible call centers. The kind of ones you read about, I've had people in audiences lately who come up to me and say, I've worked in one of those. 
the one where every call has to be less than 54 seconds and they get timed every time they go to the loop. And you might find a recipient's income, it's impossible for anyone to go to work in a place like that. And I think that would be a really good thing. And we'd all actually you know, get better service and have a better life as a result, not just people working in those horrible call centers. So I think you know, we can start to create images of, and we do need to paint pictures of how citizens' income can change things, much as it will my forest wife, the economist. A few other points that I just wanted, wanted to throw into the mix. So I talked a lot about justice, and I think that is a good way of talking about citizens' income. But I think one of the ways that I, I really haven't heard anyone talking about citizens' income, and I think we should explore more, is a human rights perspective on citizens' income. We think about, we kind of accept the right to food, to clothing, to basic shelter as being a human right, but we often talk about other kind of human rights more, but it is the most basic human right of all. And you know, we didn't talk about that much in Britain until recent years because it was just taken as granted, taken as available to everyone, but it isn't anymore. And we can think of it, I think, through a lot of work talking about a citizen's income, a basic income as a human right. It's your access to the basic resources that allow you to continue to live with decency and not have to rely on charity. And now there's another interesting thought, which is only a new thought to me that it came up in Manchester that I thought I'd mention here because it's, I think, it's a new, new idea that I haven't heard discussed before. In Manchester, one of the speakers was saying that if you probably have people who will be prepared to work less under um, the citizens' income, and if you withdraw some of the labour from the market, you start to rebalance the balance of power between labour and capital. And I think there's some interesting thoughts to be taught there, particularly, John, you were talking about getting unions on board. And that's an interesting thing to talk about with the unions and think about the new unions. So I think we do have to acknowledge that there are actually some risks of citizens' income as well, certainly as I see it from a political aspect. And I think one of the ways to think about that is to think about what we've actually seen happen with an inadequate minimum wage in Britain over recent years. What we've seen, what we saw under the, under the previous Labour government, was we saw a situation where minimum wage was low and kept getting lower gradually than did last year in the Labor government. And it was topped up by what I call corporate welfare, which was primarily housing benefits, family tax credits. And actually, if you think about it, you know, a basic requirement of any, you know, any individual, any worker, is they have to continue to live. It kind of assumes that they're going to have a shower most days. It's assumed that they're not sleeping on the break outside the shop. They've got somewhere to, to sleep. And we had companies, particularly big companies, employing workers on less than a living wage. Human mistakes are popping up different. Right. And this is where I think you can actually see there's a risk, I think, with a very low citizen's income. You know, there are right-wing people who promote the citizen's income as a concept. And you can see a situation where a citizen's income could be a kind of corporate welfare that actually tops up low wages that allow people to continue to live while being exploited. And that's where you know the whole issue of what level you set the citizens' income at is difficult. And I think it's something we've really got to explore a lot more and look at the potentially socially regressive impact of it as well as the socially positive impact of it. So I suppose I, I'd like to finish. I'm, 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 I'm going to keep fairly short so, so that everyone still has their lunch break. Okay. Um, we've talked quite a lot already today about change, and I think. I talked about how, you know, at the moment we've got the politics of fear with UKIP and we need to offer the politics of hope. But I think part of that hope is really thinking about where we are politically at the current, current moment in time. Because it's a little bit like my, my first degree was actually a science degree, so I, I sometimes go back to those science backgrounds. And what we know about evolution, and it used to be actually when I was taught science, uh, evolution was this gradual thing, so you know, gradually things change, so the giraffe's neck gradually got longer and longer and longer and that's how you ended up with a giraffe. And actually we know in terms of evolution what happens now is what they call punctuated equilibrium. You have long periods where nothing much changes and then suddenly practically everything changes. And I think that's a very useful way to think about where we are now in terms of politics. As John said, as Guy said too, where we are now very clearly just isn't working. It won't continue because it can't. 
can't continue. It's an utterly unstable situation. That equilibrium has been there, but the equilibrium is broken, and we're going to have a big leap of change. And you know, I think the citizen's income is a really critical point. John offered a lot of positive suggestions about how we go about selling it. But it really would be everything changed. That cushion of security, that feeling that you don't have to chase so much stuff, that we can live within the planetary limits. It all fits together. What we've got to do is get out there and make sure that I can go on that evening news and that 15 second slot and just say basic income. Thank you. Thank you.